Good morning. And it's so good to be together on this Lord's Day morning. Uh, this is one of my favorite weekends of the year as we, um, as I get to be with our, our uh, young people all weekend and we get to host young people from all over and um, just the example and the encouragement that they are to us. I, I just uh, feel like we, we need to highlight. I really appreciate the, the young men who came up and spoke and read this morning. Uh, but also just all of the leadership, all of the participation, all of the friendship that you've all shown to one another throughout this weekend. It's been a really special weekend. Another thing I'm excited about, this is less so, but right now is, uh, is the season for the Olympics. And I love the Olympics. And it makes you think as you watch these athletes just pour themselves into their, their training and then their performance, the world class, the best there is, it makes you think about the effort it takes. And it makes you then jump to, at least for me, the, the way that Paul highlights athletics and those original Olympic Games or the Isthmian Games that were hosted in Corinth to talk about how we should run. He says, don't you know that everybody in a race is running, but only one gets the prize Run that you may obtain it. Run to win. Give it your all. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. And so I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. I'm purposeful. I'm intentional. I pour myself into what I'm trying to accomplish. And that means looking at every factor. You look at the way these athletes train. You look at the way these athletes work, and you just see them putting everything they have into it. Last night, Katie Ledecky, who's an American swimmer, probably, well, definitely the greatest, greatest woman, female swimmer, maybe, maybe the greatest. Her and Michael Phelps are up there at the top. And last night, she won her fourth gold medal in the same event. And she has a whole host of, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 medals overall. But in the same event, she won, she's the first American athlete, female athlete to do this, uh, win four in a row in the same event. And and on, I think, Thursday night, she was talking in an interview immediately after she won gold, a gold medal in the 1500, where she was like the full length of the pool ahead of everybody else in the race. She said, I kind of let my mind wander during the race. You know, think about 1500, that is a long race, back and forth, back and forth, 15 times. She said, I was thinking about, I was kind of like saying their names in my head. Everybody who trained with me. All the people who have been part of me getting here, basically. I was kind of like saying their names in my head and thinking about them, she said. And so what was a factor that she cited, the factor that she cited, that she brought up whenever they were talking to her about her achievement? What gave her that little extra edge? And she talked about her partners, about those Florida boys. She trains with a bunch of guys down in Florida that push me every day. I know I make your life hard a lot of days, but you guys made my life a lot easier today. And then she talked about her friends. She said, everyone who has supported me for all those years. And finally, she talked about her mentors. She talked about those women who have set the standard for so many years and inspired me. These, the people that surrounded her, her support group, her, her circle that keeps her going and points the way and gets her started. This is that little factor. You know, they look at everything. They look at how they jump off. Can I turn a little bit quicker? Can I eat 10 grams more carbs or more protein in a day? Whatever I can do, how much sleep should I get? And she says, here's the biggest factor, is who am I spending my time with? Who am I surrounding myself with? To get where we want to go, we need to Think about who our partners and our friends and our mentors are to get where we want to go. 
will need helping hands along the way. As Ecclesiastes 4 talks about, two are better than one. A, a cord with three strands is not easily broken. We need each other. And so we want to talk about the friendship factor. And as you're thinking about not only your life here and what's going to bring you success in your relationships and, and your career and your uh, health and all those kinds of factors, but as we think especially about eternity and what's going to make the difference for us. What, what factor can change whether you go this way or that way at that fork on the road? You have to look at your friendships and, and no time in life more so than in youth. It's just so critical that we think about this. And I want to talk about three specific factors within that friendship factor. And the first is what I'll call the walking with the wise factor. And Rick read for us Proverbs 13, 20. Those who walk with the wise will be wise. Those who walk with the wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. So we watched some movie clips at the beginning of some of our lessons uh, this Saturday and Friday night. And one of them that I brought up with this is a scene from an old Robin Williams movie, Dead Poet Society, where he has the guys walk in a circle. And these guys that are walking in a circle, immediately they start, they're first they're, they're just want, you know, doing their own thing, and then Within a minute, they start all walking at the same exact clip. And so much so that everybody around them starts clapping to each of their steps. And everybody's in the same rhythm. And he brings up Robert Frost and how he, he said, I came to, uh, I chose the road less traveled. He talked about marching to the beat of a different drum. But the fact is, we tend to walk like those we walk with. It just happens. It is almost impossible. It is so hard to avoid. If you completely surround yourself with people who are pulling you in one direction, it is really hard to be the one person that is completely different. We need a support group. That's what the church is. We need a circle of strong, godly, wise friends who can be a counterculture to everything that's going on around us. And so Proverbs 12, 26, and I, I like the way the NIV, I think this is the, the closest to the Hebrew. The, it says the righteous chooses... The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. They choose their friends carefully. And, and this is what one Hebrew scholar said about this. Bruce Waltke said, the righteous person searches out, that's the meaning of this, chooses carefully, careful, diligent, and penetrating examination in order to find what he called his confidential, his personal advisor or his close friend. We are looking carefully, we are searching, we are examining to see who should I be surrounding myself with? Who should be my close friends? It doesn't mean that you're not a friend to other people, but who is the circle that is anchoring me? And we talked a bit about that idea of, yeah, it, we're not avoiding being a friend to a weaker Christian who's making a lot of bad choices, or to those who aren't Christians who we want to influence in the right way. But our core, we need to anchor ourselves in these relationships in the church with the godly, with the wise, so that we're bringing those outside in rather than us being pulled out. So walking with the wise factor, you walk like those you walk with. But number two, a second factor is the at all times factor. We read earlier, Proverbs 17, 17, that 
a, a friend loves at all times. There's, a, there's this German adhesive company. You know, adhesives are used in all kinds of things these days. This is what holds your, your iPhone together. This is stuff that's used in putting your car together. It's not like it's not like Elmer's glue. This is like super strong stuff. And there's this German company that set the world record for the strongest glue, the strongest adhesive. And what they did is on a circle space the size of the top of a Coke can, they put this adhesive and then they lifted up a garbage truck that hold, this, this adhesive is holding onto. And so... It's an illustration for sticking something together so strong, nothing can pull it apart. Well, what is the thing that sticks us together? Proverbs 18.24 says, a man of many companions or many so-called friends will fall to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Well, what makes you stick closer than a brother? was found in that other proverb we looked at, Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. What is the heart of friendship? Loyalty and love. Nobody shows us this more than Jesus, as we were singing about that true friend who loved us when we were at our worst. And a true friend... They'll call you to accountability, as we talked about a lot. But they are seeing you and loving you and caring about you and standing by you when you're not showing your best. And that matters. That is a big deal. As Proverbs 13, or as 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, defines love, it says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things, believes all things, hopes all th In other words, love is not only enduring and standing by it, but love is trying to see the best and believing the best and hoping for the best in you. Raymond Brand said, what is a friend? I will tell you. It is a person with whom you dare to be yourself. He seems to ask of you to put on nothing, only to be what you are. You do not have to be on your guard. He talks about in the rest of that quote, those things that other people might look at and, and think that you're crazy because of it, they see and accept you. They see and love you still. Love at all times. At all times. The all-time factor says that Christ-like love and loyalty bond us together. And, you know, nobody should be better at that. And I believe most of the time nobody is better at that than those who are trained to love and loyalty by Jesus Christ. Jesus shows us how to be a friend. And in fact, in 3 John... John describes the church not as the church of Christ or as Christians or as disciples, but as the friends. He says there, the friends here greet the friends there. There is a tremendous bond because we are Christ's friends and now, therefore, we are one another's friends and we have learned to be friends. But that doesn't mean we just say everything's fine and just accept one another and our sin and just leave it alone because we're so loving. That is not real love. That's not what Jesus did for us. Jesus loved us when we were at our worst, but he didn't say, you know, it's okay, just stay that way. We need friends who care enough to speak up. The faithful are the wounds of a friend. What's the difference between a mugger's knife and a surgeon's scalpel? I mean, they both wound you. Both are going to cut you. Both have the ability to hurt. Does a friend's wounds not hurt? That's why they're called wounds. They hurt. I can remember every time that 
a friend has come and given me some hard truths that I needed to hear. But the difference is, one of them wants to heal you, and one of them wants to take from you. And sometimes it's hard to heal, right? It's painful. Sometimes it takes something that we have to look at ourselves in difficult ways. We have to hear things we don't want to hear, and we have to receive it well. And so throughout the weekend, we've done some work where we've taken different contrasts to help us think through this. We contrasted things like, what's the difference between trying to please people and trying to serve people? You know, serving, you might tell them something or do something that they don't want, but it's for their best. But pleasing is just go along to get along. Talked about the difference between trying to control people versus trying to influence people. You just can't do it. You want to twist them, get them in that right place. But it, when we let go of that and we start working to guide and to come alongside and to say the things that can help them, there is incredible power in that because that's how God works in us. He doesn't control us. He influences us. He directs us. He shows us. He tells us what's going to happen if we do this, we do that. We talked about the difference between, for instance, harsh words and straight talk. You know, it doesn't have to, have to tear people down, but it, it needs to sometimes get to a hard truth where we're being honest with each other. And that is what a friend does. Proverbs 27, 9 says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Earnest counsel, like sincere, honest. He wants your best. And so he's not just telling you what you want to hear. He's not just saying whatever, his, you know, everybody has an opinion about everything. An old preacher friend of mine used to say all the time, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. Everybody has an opinion about, about everything, it seems like. But this isn't about their opinion. They're going to thoughtfully, prayerfully say, here's what I can tell you that is going to try to lead you in the right way. If you're asking, here is the way that I think you need to go. And that's where the sweetness of a friend comes in. Or as was read earlier, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. It takes sometimes some sparks flying, but we are here to sharpen each other. Those are some of the Proverbs that really start to direct us in what friendship is meant to look like. What friendship is in, in the hands of the Lord guiding it, what friendship can become. So This morning we talked about the difference between enjoying a friendship and being a friend. And... Um, we noticed that friendships are one of the great blessings of, of life. And you can't enjoy a friendship without being a friend. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the best way to make a friend is to be a friend. But you might be a friend to someone and not really have friendship. Because friendship is mutuality. Friendship is a blessing but being a friend or acting like a friend is a purpose. It's, it's what we're here to do. Think of the Good Samaritan in Luke 15. He showed up for this man on the side of the road. This Samaritan finds this Jewish man and helps him. Maybe there was an unlikely friendship that came from it afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, it's a story. It's a parable. But, you know, there could have been a great friendship, this Jew and this Samaritan together. Wouldn't you think so? But at the time, that man couldn't do anything for the Samaritan, yet he reached out and acted like a friend. And that's what Jesus did for us. Nolan talked this morning around the Lord's table about how he was the friendless one from that song we sang. I mean, there on the cross, it breaks your heart to think about it. those phrases that Nolan pulled out, the Garden of Gethsemane, the friendless one, the one who gave everything for us. In Romans 5, 6 to 10, we find that it was while we were enemies 
that he acted like a friend to us. And there are lots of people in the world, and maybe some here, who Jesus has acted like a friend to, who have not established a friendship with Jesus. We also sing, I'll be a friend to Jesus. And there might be somebody else in the world that you are meant to have a friendship with or you are meant to be a friend with, but that is not for you. You are there to show up for them. And it's not going to bless you that much if that's the case and there's going to be limits to your closeness to the real friendship, but you can keep showing up for them as a friend. We talked about how we can mentor as friends and how we can partner as friends and how we can enjoy one another as friends. But if we want to be a friend to Jesus, Jesus tells us how to do that in John 15. And here's what he says. John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for us. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask of the father in my name, he may give you. I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends. And here's why. You know what I'm doing. I've revealed it to you. Here's why. Here's how you love me as a friend. You submit your life to, to my direction. You yield to me if you keep my commandments. So we'll close the lesson with this thought. That Jesus wants to be your friend. Jesus has already acted like a friend with you, but you might not have fellowship with him if you have not submitted to him, keeping his commandments. And here's how that works. You hear who Jesus is. You hear this story of the gospel and you recognize the truth and the power in it. And you, you believe in him. You trust in him as the Savior, the Christ, the King, the Lord. And doing that, you repent and say, I will follow you and keep your commandments. You just turn your mind and your heart and your life towards him and walk with him as a friend does. And you confess, you say it out loud. I'm not ashamed that he's my friend and I'm his friend. I'm not afraid, ashamed that he's my Lord and I'm his his disciple. And so you say it out loud before people. I confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then you are baptized into him, being buried and dying with Christ, and then raising, having your sins washed away, to walk a different way and be with him into eternity. If you haven't taking those steps toward friendship with Jesus. If you haven't become his friend, we invite you to do that. And if there's some way, if you've been walking with him and have drifted away and we can support you or pray for you or you need to confess to the friends here, we would love to serve you and support you in your walk with Christ as we stand and sing.